everyone. Just one second, please. I'm setting up my iPad. And I'll give you the link for the slides right now. Give me one second for setting up the iPad. I'm sending my iPad, so just one second, please. Sorry. It's really weird. There will be a quiz so very soon.
So I'm having trouble sending my PDF to iPad. It's really weird. Okay, there we go. So apparently the internet wasn't working on my iPad. School Wi-Fi is really bad. I think everyone knows that, but it really sucks, I think. Okay, so um, let's get started. Oh my gosh. There we go, finally. Okay, sorry for starting it late. All right, so the will be quiz. So here are the three problems since we are almost 10 minutes late. We'll probably do the um, quiz until 4.20 instead of 4.10. I'll create the poll. So let's begin. So I'll give you three minutes. And then after three minutes, I'll start with the recap. And then let's take a look at what your answers were and whether they're correct.
All right, so you can still participate in the quiz until 4.20. Uh, I'll try to finish the recap until then. And then let's see, let's go come, come back to this quiz after this recap. Uh, before that, a few announcements. So assignment one will be up this Wednesday and it will be about using recurrent neural nets to create a text classification model from scratch. And then we'll start taking attendance next week to the quiz participation. So, which means it would be good to at least come to the, uh, you know, class in the beginning to take the quiz. Although you might um, not be here for the entire class, but okay, so, all right, so lecture two recap. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. So we've talked about how we can predict um, a scale value given a scale value. So input is scalar and output is scalar. And straightforward, especially if there's a linear relationship between two values, then we can assume that there is a relationship of y equal wx plus b. It's basically an inductive bias you give to the uh, uh, model. And then you, can also, you might also want to consider how you can handle non-numeric inputs. For instance, let's say if you want to consider not just the weight, not, I mean, not just height, but also weight as the input, then for instance, like male and female, then these are classes, they are not real, real numbers. So you cannot just put them as is to the real networks, which is just the function of real numbers. So you have to actually make them into real numbers. Uh, one of the most popular options is that you basically assign a one hot vector for each category. So for instance here, female is corresponding to the first dimension and male is corresponding to second dimension and just put one for the, the corresponding category. Then in that case, then what will be the input? In this case, then the input will be here um, 160 and female, so it's one and zero. In, in male, you just basically concatenate. That's like a simplest way to um, define your input, right? In this case, your input will be, actually, I think the input was weight, right? Um, no, height, actually, sorry. So height, so 160, and input is here 168, and zero and one, and so on. And I also wanted to, I forgot to mention this, but I also wanted to say that you can also make real number input into categorical input. For instance, here I put 160, but maybe you want to make a range of heights. Something like if your height is below 155, then you're uh, class one. If it's between 155 and 160, then class two, 160 to 165, then class three, and so on. Then in that case, then you can actually translate the height into um, categories too. And then you, translate the category back to this one hot vector. So one example would be that maybe you can say uh, category one is, I'll just make two, two categories for height, just for the simplicity. Uh, 170 or below, I'll say category one and 171 and above category two. Then in this case, then that will be um, category one. So it will be one zero and then one zero, right? So this it's corresponding to the height of a. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Just All right. So um, then in that case, then character will be uh, below or equal to one seventy. But you can also translate that into um, 173 will be category two. So it will be zero one and female, so one zero. So in that case, then this corresponds to bigger than 170, right? So that's an option that you might want to consider. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So in that case, then your input became four instead of two. 
or three, right? And then we talk about how we can handle also vector output, not just the vector input. It's straightforward. You just have to, um, in that where when you're out, you have more than two outputs, then that you'll be vector output, right? More, more equal or more than two outputs. And we talked about the parameterization with a simple neural network. And we, we, we saw that actually you can create a neural network by adding single linear transformation with um, some bias, but then we, we, we saw that actually just having many layers with just linear transformation is just one linear transformation. Um, so we want to add something between those layers, which is apparently activation function that we discussed. Um, so there are several activation functions and I told you that uh, these are all valid activation functions that are uh, used a lot. And especially these days for just the activation point of view, ReLU or ReLU variants are mostly most used. Transformer uses something that's very similar to ReLU. I mean, BERT uses very, something very similar to ReLU called JELU. We talked about that. It's a bit of a um, smoothness at the, that, um, at the edge or at the, uh, the point of inflection between the um, y equal x and y equal zero. And we saw that if you are, if you add a lot of layers, not just the widening, but you have to actually add a lot of layers, uh, yeah, the depth is important, then you can approximate any function within the target error rate if you can actually have a lot of layers. So you can actually mathematically prove that that's actually the, um, the beauty of uh, neural networks and that's called universal approximation theorem. And we saw that the um, loss function measures the difference between the model's output and the ground truth. And the um, one of the mo most obvious choices is Euclidean distance. And in practice, we, do, we can just square it. And then we saw that the training and overfitting where the um, um, getting the minimum or very close to zero loss in the training data doesn't mean that you solve the problem. You have to actually do really well on the test data, which is basically testing how well the model generalized to example you haven't seen. If it doesn't generalize well, but still works well on the training data, we said that this is overfitting. And I told you that the probability generalization is one of the most important goals in machine learning. So let's talk about the answers, right? So first of all, true or false, a neural network with a fixed number of layers and activations can approximate any function within a target error margin by increasing the number of nodes in each layer. So here the, uh, the actually the trick was, I'll actually end the poll right now and show you the results. So, so I think most people answer true, but some answer false. So I guess this was a hard problem um, so the trick, this was a trick question because here's a fixed number of layers, right? Suppose then this neural network is single layer, then can you approximate any function by just having a lot of uh, nodes in that layer? The answer is no, because in that case, then you don't have, you don't have any activation functions. So probably your function will be just linear, even if, um, I mean, there is an activation function, but still you cannot model complex models because the activation function only matters after you have more than two, two or more layers. So the point is that what's really important is not just the, um, the, the number of dimensions in each layer or number of nodes in each layer, but then the depth. So it shouldn't be a fixed number. You should be able to increase number of layers to approximate any function. So this is false. Number two, ReLU function, which is um, y equals zero of x is not a good activation function because it is piecewise linear and hence cannot model not linear functions. So looks like actually almost everyone got this correct. Yeah, it's false. ReLU is actually very effective and it is able to um, approximate pretty well nonlinear functions. And number three, this is I think also a hard question because um, most people, um, Actually, more people said false, but also a non-trivial number of people said true. And in fact, um, I'll say the answer is true. 
Why? Because, I mean, I, I think I mentioned this in last class, traditional machine learning might say that if model has low training loss and high validation loss, then, oh, you have really too, too big model. You have to decrease the model size to do better. That was traditional machine learning. But then these days, that's not necessarily true because you might also improve your validation loss by just increasing model size. And the point is that actually these days, I think a more correct explanation is that if model is too small, then you will overfit. Of course, if model is too big, then you might overfit if your data is small too. But it's also true that if model is too small, you might overfit because um, that means then your model's capacity is too small that the model, uh, when you train it, rather than trying to um, you know, find some, some generalizable um, patterns between the input and output, it tries to just memorize the input. So it's true that you want to consider improving it by increasing model size. It's very effective. Okay, so false, false, true. So hopefully, um, okay. Yeah, so there, so you're right. So, um, so I think the question that the actually, this might have been also a trick question because you're not wrong. I'm not saying that what you said is wrong. So you might also want to consider reducing number of parameters. But what I wanted to say is that that's not the only option. In many cases, it's also true that you might also want to consider improving it by increasing model size. And um, so it was maybe a trick question because I said that one of options you might want to consider, right? It's not like uh, that's the always the, um, the only method you should consider. And you're right. Um, and, the, 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 and it just becomes, makes the problem harder because right now there is no single solution. You, know, you never know. Maybe given your data size, you might actually have to uh, reduce the number of parameters, as you said. So if the number of data is too small, then uh, what Soro said is right. It's very hard to actually make the model better by just increasing model size. And so the popular belief right now is that this depends on data size. So if the data is too small, then you might not improve by just increasing model size. You might just have to just decrease the number of parameters. But if data is big enough, then you might also be able to increase the, you might be able to improve the model by just increasing the model size. Yeah, that's right. So I think that what you, what you said is also very a, way, a good way to say it. So uh, the point in here is that, so maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that the traditional machine learning has a like entirely opposite view. In fact, as you said, actually this was also kind of what traditional machine learning um, scientists also knew. It's just that, that the importance, importance of that was relatively not emphasized, but, um, but what you said is true. So the interpretation is that um, the generalizing is not just about not overfitting, but also being able to model it. And being able to model, it requires a lot of parameters, more parameters, right? So if you do not give the model enough capacity to model it, then the model will tend to overfit. I think that's uh, quite what to say. So in, 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 in other words, you don't want to give too hard task on a model that's not capable of it because it will only try to overfit. That's the only thing it can do. All right, so, but yeah, good questions, really good questions. Uh, let me know if you have any question throughout the lecture too. All right, let's move to lecture three. So we're a bit behind. All right, so um, we talked about overfitting. We talked about um, training and generalization. So it's good that, um, you know, training will lead to hopefully generalization, but how do we train? And there is very one single dominant way of doing this. And I think 
it's good because you don't have to really think much about it. Um, I can just tell you the answer, which is that you just have to use gradient descent to optimize your model. And there is very, I think there are very few other options other than gradient uh, descent. There are really few options that I think it's really silly to talk about anything else than gradient descent, but um, I think it shouldn't, it shouldn't be taken as granted that gradient, gradient descent is the, the default um, strategy for optimizing neural networks. Because in the early days, when you're given your, uh, something to optimize for, people try to do a very analytical way, which means that uh, a way of finding the answer um, by guaranteed way of finding the answer, basically. For instance, um, linear, linear, I would say linear function, linear, linear, uh, linear equation, with um, you know several variables to optimize for. It has usually has a really a nice analytical solution, but once you get to nonlinearity, then there is no analytical solution. So you will have to actually approximate it. And one way to approximate is that um, is gradient descent. And it's very simple. Gradient descent is that um, you just basically find the gradient of the function with respect to the loss function, and then just basically try to go to the, um, the parameter parameters that actually gives you smaller loss, right? And so that's what I want to say again, that this is one of the most fascinating characteristics about neural networks that distinguish them from other methods such as SAT. SAT here is a satisfiable test, you, you basically Boolean uh, problems. And um, so I wanted to, again, emphasize that because neural networks became a dominant method and Gradient descent became the dominant optimization method for neural networks. It's often taken as granted, but I just want to say that there never should be because actually it took a lot of time for people to actually, uh, uh, actually, I would say, not I'll, I'll not say a lot of time to find this, but it's more of a took a lot of time for people to actually admit that there isn't actually a better way than this. Not many ways. Of course, uh, we have some variants, like we have uh, some um, some optimization method that use actually momentum, such as Adam. So Adam is just gradient descent with some momentum. So what is momentum? You have a gradient descent method, and suppose that you start from here, then if you just do the gradient descent, then it's likely that this will go this to local minima, but then by having momentum, it's something like you basically actually drop a ball here, it's more of. So you just drop a ball and this ball has some you know, potential that it might actually go up to here, right? Then it might just go over the, um, the hill so that it actually can um, go to the smaller local minima. That's basically the momentum. And you get why it's called momentum, right? Momentum is basically just trying to um, keep your speed in physics, right? So. Um, gradient descent doesn't have momentum, but Adam has a momentum. There are other methods. I think most people use these days Adam or Adam W. So it's good that um, gradient descent, but still is basically really very, uh, very based on the gradient descent. Um, and in general, I think when you say gradient descent, you mean actually um, very technically, you mean batch gradient descent, which is you're give, given your training data, you want to find the gradient with respect to the entire training data. Um, so that's all training examples. But in practice, and also there is a term called stochastic gradient descent, SGD, which is uh, actually to be very formal using just one sample. But then in practice, what when people say SGD, they actually mean not just one, but uh, several examples. And statistically, the, the stochastic means sampling, not just a one sample. So uh, you just basically increase number of samples to reduce variance of your current mini batches gradient respect, with respect to the batch gradient, which is the, um, the target approximation, right? The target of the approximation. And, um, but also, it's also worth noting that, so then is it then we also always want batch gradient descent, but just because of, of the uh, efficiency or because we cannot make the batch 
too big, you're, we are using stochastic gradient descent? The answer is not always true. In fact, um, when the data size is not too big, it is empirically shown that smaller mini batch size is preferred, especially to have some variance. And it helps generalization and your optimization because variance causes the model to sometimes go over the, this local maximus that without even momentum and with even small learning rate because you have some uncertainty and some variance in your gradient. And, and there was also, there's like a popular belief, I think about until like three to four years ago that there is no reason to make your mini batch size bigger than 16. And I think this was a really popular belief in the image domain. And it was completely crushed actually after um, coming into this um, large language models, BERT, GPT, where the batch size is really important. It's, uh, well, I can't say it's always bigger the better, but at least it goes up to like hundreds. So um, it wasn't true that the 16 is enough. And one, one more importance that I want to always uh, emphasize is that uh, we're not looking for the global minima. So what does this mean? So it's a very important point because if you actually look for global minima, that means that you're always minimizing for the, uh, the training data entirely, right? But then the issue is that it's not guaranteed that the global minima is always good, look, good minima. So, uh, experimentally, what really we really need is that uh, not just global minima, but a minima that can generalize well and do well on the test data. And that's very, very important distinction that I think when you're going to, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, company interviews, this trick question might come in. I actually asked that a lot when I was uh, yeah, interviewing too, that um, generalization doesn't mean that you are trying to reach the global minima. It's about going to some good local minima that does well on test data. And it's not guaranteed that the local minima is the actual global minima. And we don't know, we don't know really, uh, we don't really know what makes a good local minima that generalize well. It's very experimental, very, very little, things about very little theoretical aspects about this have been discovered. Okay, so how does gradient descent works mathematically? It's very simple. So um, you're given a loss function and loss function hopefully looks like this some convex function, although it doesn't, it's much more complex, but you're given loss function and you basically compute its gradient. Um, so it might be a bit confusing because this graph uses W, but the equation uses theta. Sorry, I, I copied and pasted different two, different two equation and diagram from different sources, but hopefully you get the point that it's just the uh, same thing. So let's just use say theta for the, um, the simplicity. Then you basically just compute the, the gradient. You differentiate the loss function with respect to each parameter, basically by computing the partial derivative. And then you, you can just compute partial derivative for each weight, right? And then suppose you're looking at the, this specific weight, uh, theta j, then theta j gets updated by uh, in, a, in the negative direction of this gradient multiplied by alpha, which is the learning rate. So this is the learning rate. So what happens if the learning rate is too big or small? So what happens too small? Then it will just basically climb down very slowly. So uh, it might take more iterations, more time, more money because you're using your computer, which is just a money per time. And also one of the uh, disadvantages of using very small learning rate is that you, you never overshoot. And overshooting is not always bad because sometimes you have to actually climb up some, some hills I showed in the previous slide and then but you'll never do that if you have really small learning rates. And another, uh, but then what is the, then the problem with a large learning rate Then the other way actually, right? Because if you have too big learning rate then you'll basically move like this 
and that you might, you know, just go to some other um, uh, local minimas that's actually not ideal by just going up the hill or even worse, you might fluctuate because if you overshoot too much, then this might go to like here and then this might go to here. It's very, it'll make this uh, kind of diverge. So alpha shouldn't be too big either. So in practice, um, the atom optimizers actually also control these um, learning rates, unlike SD. So um, atom optimizers or modern optimizers are handling your learning rate automatically. You don't have to worry too much about it, but still you have some scheduling uh, rate um, that oh, actually there was one more question I think right okay I actually missed this question I'll come back to this question right after this slide so um, in practice then when you're using item optimizer or modern optimizers then you don't have to worry too much about the learning rate you can just set some a number and then just have some maybe um, manual scheduling but not too much um, so your, their question from Umbiar, which was that, is it okay to understand that the model need more than one activation function to approximate any functions? It's more accurate to say that activation function actually always goes with linear layer. So it's more accurate to say you need to have more than one layers or actually given the target function, you might need to have very many number of layers, but the universal approximate theorem is saying that if the target error rate, you know, target error rate means that how large you can actually, um, how how much you can, how how much you are okay with, how 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 large the error can be, and you're still okay. So it's basically the margin that you're allowing the model. So that's the target error rate, and given the target error rate, you are guaranteed to be within that error rate if you can um, by having a finite but still very large number of layers. And this, how I say this might be really confusing if you, if you haven't taken some advanced math class. If actually, um, so this, this, this kind of way of saying is actually very core to um, real analysis class. It's like upper division math class that you probably learn in your um, fourth grade, a uh, fourth year of uh, college. It's not like a engineering requirement, but then, um, so, you, but then, so it's actually not, what I'm trying to say is that it's not, it might not be super um, straightforward. So it's okay. But the point is that if you want to approximate something that you have to stack up a lot of layers. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna take a five minutes break until 4.46. And then I'm gonna use the, uh, the remaining 30 minutes to go over the, the rest of the lecture. So see you soon.
Okay, so hopefully you had a short, nice break. Let's come back to back propagation. So, so we saw that if we can compute the gradient, then we can optimize the model well. And then now the natural question is then how can we compute the gradient? And if you compute the gradient in a vanilla way, then it can be very inefficient. So the there's a trick called back propagation, which is that after a single pass, forward pass, forward pass here means that nothing about optimization, but you basically compute, you know, the each layer by layer. So you you get given the input and you compute the the numbers. What, what, what will be the output of the first layer? And then you compute the, what will be the output of the second layer and so on until the, the final output. This is called four pass. And after you compute the four pass, you store some values, not just the outputs, but some necessary values here. And these store, storing these necessary values will help you compute the gradients at every layer by going backward. That's called backward pass. And, like this entire thing is called basically, you can, the fact that you can actually compute grade in this way is called back propagation. So I'm not going to go into details because anyways, we're not, it's not the scope of, of this class. If you're interested in this kind of things, you can search online, you can take other classes in the uh, five levels, 500 levels, but let me know if you have any question. The point is that also, again, back propagation was not there in the early neural network days and then people found it later. Okay, so I think, why do I want to do this? Okay, okay, right. Okay, so here we go. So, okay. So I think now it's clear that we can, so I think this was not, so, Coming back to this example, okay, here's the motivation why I put this example here. So coming back to this example. So I think we know now that, so let's suppose that we actually make this into um, one numerical and one categorical again. So then here the input will be um, 160 corresponding to the height. And then there is a weight, no, not weight, but this is input and this is, gender also input and this output. So then gender will be female being one zero. And then here the male will be 180 and zero one. And then y, uh, y will be 55, 75. That's great. So in that case, then we saw that we can actually model this into WX plus B where uh, W is a matrix, X is a vector, B is a vector, Y is a vector. So here Y, B is um, vector of size, what um, it's size of a, not vector actually here, it's scalar, right? Because you're predicting weight. So number of rows is one and they're actually scalar, but then X will be a vector. There will be number of rows will be three because you have three numbers as input and then you have one column, so column one column vector, right? And then what will be W, W will be actually also vector because the output is a scalar. So it will be, you have a output one and then input being three. So this is something that you should be very clear about it at this point. Let me know if you have any confusion. Then that's good. So in this case was that wasn't that hard because we're tr trying to predict the weight being a scalar value. And that was our assumption from this from the beginning. Input is real number, output is real number. Then everything is first straightforward because everything is continuous and real number. But what if we want to actually predict um, a category? Not just that now input is being the a category like gender, but also we want to predict the output to be a category. In this case, maybe we want to differentiate between weight of smaller than seventy kilograms and bigger than seventy kilograms. Then in that case, then weight will be something like um, here, um, this will be class one. So it will be um, smaller than 70 or equal and bigger than 70. Or you might also want to predict something like uh, 
can you want to predict something like, is it adult or um, teenager? That will be also another type of class, how you can actually, um, what actually predicting a class given a real number inputs or given a mix of real number and categorical inputs. So how can we actually handle categorical outputs, not just numerical outputs? So it's, we discuss how we can handle non-numerical inputs. It was clear, very, uh, there was easy solution that we make this into one half vector. Then what if we want to do non-numerical outputs? And the answer is actually very similar. We want to make that into one half vectors as the outputs. For example, you want to predict if a person is an adult or a teenager, given weight and gender, then we want to predict a vector of 1 comma 0 for adults and 0 comma 1 for teenager. And it's very, very, very um, straightforward way of translating um, categorical output into a vector. So we can still use the MSC. Remember what this was, right? The mean square error, because you now have a vector output. But in practice, this doesn't work well. So why doesn't it work well? There are several issues. One is that it's very hard to actually, you know, make your output close to zero one because there is no reason for the model to, I mean, there is no anything that stops the model to be bigger than one or smaller than um, one. It's very hard for the model to stop at one because suppose that you just basically have a, you know, linear layer output, then it can be anything like real numbers, but then it's very hard to make it stop at one or zero. So your loss will be very large in many cases, but not just, not just that, but then it's also very hard to actually, I would say, guarantee that the, um, I would say, well, but then I, I'll just actually go to the really the big reason why this is not working well. The reason is that actually mathematically, I, I was trying to, you know, some give some more of a, uh, English ex explanations, but one of the really the reasons is that actually if you used MSC loss, then the the gradient will be always I'll say this way the gradient will be not um, not so I'll say gradient is not super large when the your error is really large, and the gradient will be also not super small when your error is small. But the, ideally, you want to make your gradients very large when your error is big and you want to make your gradient very small when your error is small so that you can train really fast when your error is big and then you can train very in a very fine grained way when your error is small. So you, you want that behavior. And also you want this, uh, you, do, you want to avoid, for instance, suppose that your prediction is something like 1000 and um, negative 100. Your output is 1000 negative 100. How would you interpret this? It's very hard, right? What does that mean? Does it mean that it should be adult because your number at the adult side is bigger than the teenager's side, which is like negative 100? It's not super convenient to actually, uh, also not super mathematical or a very, it's not clean to formulate the problem this way. So I was trying to motivate this in a very difficult way, but I'll give you um, what the, the, the uh, what is like very common in the field, which is modeling the categorical outputs as a probabilistic model. So instead of minimizing MSC, we want to treat the model's output as a probabilistic distribution over the labels and maximize the likelihood of the correct answers. And this is called maximum likelihood estimation, MLE. And it's very uh, maybe difficult sentence to understand, but I'll give you a really straightforward way of saying it. So suppose that the model's output is 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, then we want to interpret this output as, okay, the model thinks it's 20% likely that this is an adult and 80% likely that this is a teenager. It's much more straightforward than trying to interpret like 1,000 negative 100, 
right? So then it's very clear that in this case, then probably want to say the model is more confident that this is a teenager, right? Although there is uh, some chance that this might be um, adult. Then, um, but then there's one problem. So it's, it's, it, this is more about interpretation, not how the output will look like. And still you're, you're not guaranteeing the model to actually have this probabilistic distribution. Your summation might not be equal to zero or equal to one. If it's probabilistic distribution, that it always should be equal to one. And number two, there's, there should be any negative number. So there, that's the two requirements, right? I forgot to put here, but then number one is that summation is equal to one. And the number two is that uh, for all probability, it should be at least zero or bigger, right? This two, these two is the requirements for a distribution to be probabilistic. And uh, uh, actually a vector to be a valid probabilistic distribution. And in order to make this probabilistic distribution, the, the standard way is to use a function called softmax. And what it does is that given the output of the model being Z, you basically exponentiate each value and then you just uh, make that numer numerator and then denominator will be summation of the all the exponentiation of all the values. So suppose then the vector Z was 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, uh, not 0 0.2 actually. Um, suppose something like uh, three and negative one. So maybe your neural networks output were three and negative one. Then this is not valid probabilistic distribution, but you can translate this into valid probabilistic distribution by applying this softmax. In that case, it will be e to the power of three over e to the power of three plus e to the power of negative one. And the second dimension will be e to the power, power e to the negative one over same denominator e to the power of three plus e to the power of negative one. And it's clear that the summation will be one because they have same denominator. And when they add up all the numerators, then it's equal to the common denominator. And also it's all bigger than zero because exponentiation of any real number will be always positive. That's one way of uh, making uh, a vector into a probabilistic distribution. I'm not saying it's the only way, I'm not saying it's the best way all the time, but when you don't have, you don't have any, when you're self try, approaching a problem in your networks, probably this is the first thing you want to try. Okay. So then after you model this into probabilistic, um, if, you, if you create a probabilistic model for the categorical outputs, then what you want to do for the MLE, maximum likelihood, estimation is that you want to compute the joint probability and try to maximize it. But there's one problem, second problem, right? Because what, what that is, is that the joint probability is too small. It's gonna cause underflow. What does that mean? Because you have many examples and you basically have about say 120 examples and you want to optimize the joint probability of every example being correct, right? That's MLE. Then maybe the first examples probability was 0.1 and second example 0.2. You multiply all these hundred times. And I can tell you that if there's like, if they're like 0.1 for every example, then your, your joint probability will, will be something like 0.1 to the power of hundred. And you might say, okay, how large, that, how small that can be. But this is basically one over 10 to the power of hundred, right? And I can tell you that this number 10 to the power 100 is larger than number of stars or number of actual planets in the whole universe. Or actually, no, not just stars, but number of atoms. That's the power of the exponentiation. 10 to the power 100 is larger than the number of atoms in the whole universe. So it's too big. You cannot do anything with this. And you're not talking about like, you know, million or billion examples. You're just talking about 100 examples, right? And that you're, you're not talking about super small probability. 
you're talking about just one tenth, which is very likely if you have many categories, not just two categories, right? So it's too small. It's not just about, you know, the modern machines is not good enough to handle that. It's just that it's too big, too small number. So you have to take the logarithm. And logarithm is very beautiful because you've turned the um, exponentiation into um, basically multiplication. So what happens if you take logarithm of this number? This will be just 100 times log 0.1, right? So that's great. And why is it okay that you take logarithm? The reason is that this is really important. Logarithm is also monotonic. If you draw the log function, then it will be something like that, where here is one. So log one is zero, whatever smaller than one will be negative, whatever bigger than one is positive, but still it's monotonic in a sense that you always have a positive slope. So if you can minimize or maximize log, then you are maximizing the value that you took log of. So if your just whole goal is to optimize something, then you can just take a log and then optimize for that and you will still have same objective. Well, I mean, at the end. And for the, just the convenience, or I'll say convention more of, you just want to make uh, positive numbers going down. That's easier to understand. So you just basically take a, take a negative, take a negative so that you make that into negative log likelihood, which is NLL. And in practice, we average the log probabilities for a stable scale, regardless of the size of the training data. Um, so here is actually, this thing is the, um, the negative log likelihood. And it's pretty clear, right? You take a negative log of the probability, which is the multiplication of all values in that distribution. And then taking a log of the product is just summation at the outside. So it becomes negative summation. And then you just turn this into, you scale this with, the size of the examples, so it becomes one over n, i to n, and log pi. And another important concept is the difference between evaluation metric and loss. And I think there are a lot of students also who get confused with this in their initial deep learning studying phase because these two are actually different. Evaluation metric and loss are different. In many cases, they're same or very similar. So that's why people get confused, but then they're different because evaluation metric is the real goal of the task. So who sets this goal? It might be you, it might be you know, your customer if you're you know, running a, a, your business, but it's something that at least as long as uh, you have, you have defined emotional learning task, then that means that this is unchangeable. It's something that you want to always achieve. And it's the absolute metric or success metric of your model. But loss is not the goal. It's actually not the goal. I mean, the real goal. It's more of a, the direction that you give to your model. And you decide this. You can decide anything for the loss. And really the important concept here is that loss is actually the expected value of the true direction of your model. Maybe a bit hard to understand, but what does that mean? So expected value, I'm talking about statistical expectation. And why is this expected value? Well, this is because your loss function, of course, is actually the true direction, but then you compute the loss function with the sample, right? So loss function becomes, I would say, it starts involving statistical or randomness as, you, as soon as you sample something, not taking the, the entire inputs or, but, but you just sample it. So in practice, training involves sampling, which means you, your sample direction 
will not be equivalent to its expected value. So this can be a bit confusing, but I'll put it this way. So your loss function, your true, your loss function applied to every training example, every possible scenario. So no randomness at all, then it will be just one constant number, right? There's a constant number actually. It will be just one constant number. But because in many cases you will have to sample, and sometimes you just sample just for the convenience. In some cases, it's actually impossible to actually compute the exact loss. We'll see that in when we're doing the uh, generation. So if you want to compute the real loss for generation decoding, you will see that you cannot compute the exact loss. So what you do is then you actually sample your loss from by sampling something that can be training example or something else. And if you sample it, then assuming you're, sam you're sampling results in Gaussian distribution, then you will have something like, like that, right? Hopefully they're centered around your real loss. If it's centered around your real loss, then we say it's unbiased, but your loss might be biased, which means maybe it's like this. It might not be off too much so that your direction is not too long, wrong, but then still you're, what you're sampling, you're, you're sampling from a distribution whose mean is not equal to the target loss. And in this case, it's clear which one you would use because they have very similar variance and then one has much more accurate by a mean than the other. One is unbiased and the other is biased. So number one is better, right? It's very clear. But what, what becomes difficult to decide is when you have a two loss function, which is like this. This is number one. And this is number two. Can you see which is better, number one and two? So one is clearly unbiased because their center is around blue, but then it's spread out too much. Oh, okay, so here the, the x-axis is loss. Sample loss, I'll say. And why is the distribution of the loss? So you can, you can think of loss as direction. So where your models should be going towards when you're doing the gradient descent. And you basically compute the loss at each mini batch, right? And then that loss actually is, what I'm trying to say is that it's not oftentimes equivalent to your true direction in the entire um, the loss space, right? So your loss space is fixed given the training data, but then you will sample something, either training examples in the classification, but you might sample more things when your task is more complex. But let's say that you're just, we're just sampling the examples, right? Training examples, then your loss at in each mini batch, your actual loss value will be different from your true loss that's based on the entire training data. So then you can try to actually see how your sample loss will be different from your actual loss. And your sample loss will be, of course, not exactly same as your true loss because you're sampling. Now you're trying to see how it get, uh, what the, what the distribution looks like. You don't want to go too far from the true loss because true loss is true direction. Uh, is it clear? Yep. So what I'm trying to say here is that the number one, I cannot always say number one is more preferred than number two because it's unbiased because number two is actually in many cases closer to real true bias, although it's actually not, unbiased, it's biased. So that's the, really the point that um, I wanna make here that in many classification tasks, your loss will be unbiased with low variance. So it doesn't really matter. It's the, this case, right? The left case. 
But in many other cases, more complex tasks, unbiased loss function might have very high variance, in which case a low variance loss with a small bias, which is the right diagram you just saw here, is preferred. And this we'll see this actually in when we're talking about the um, decoding text generation. Teacher forcing is actually, uh, it's not unbiased estimator, but it's very effective. Actor critic in reinforcement learning versus policy gradients is one other example. So another variable strategy is that we can use a low variance with a reasonably low bias in the initial stage and switch to an unbiased yet high variance loss in the later stage. So this is a really important concept in machine learning that actually penetrates through all different areas, including reinforcement learning. I just wanted to actually touch this, but probably not too much details at this point, because as I said, in most simple classification tasks, you don't have to worry about this because your loss will be unbiased and very low variance. Okay, so I think we're a little behind, but I'll try to go really quick um, for the rest of two or three minutes and then do a, a last poll. All right, so we got up to here where we can create now a neural network for image classification. We know how to optimize it. We know how to define loss function. So here, are the, if you want to classify a small image into one of digits, then input will be straightforward. It will be vector because you can just flatten the image pixel values with height times channel into one vector. So let's say with this, suppose like 14, 14, and this is, let's say just black and white, so one, then this will be just 196 values input. But output will be classes, so we have to now model this as a probabilistic distribution and then do softmax and compute the MLE, right? So we're gonna do two layer neural network. So in this case, then we have a huge vector of input. So this is like 196 inputs and this goes into, so this will be X. And then we have uh, some weight layer linear mapping, right? So then this goes into what? Say we, we get we have to because two layer, we have to actually decide the size of the latent layer. Suppose let's make that into I'll say um, 64, just for the um, I just chose it without much reason, but um, so let's say this is 64. Then we will have all these connections here. This is called weight, and this will be I'll say h and then of course we have activation function let's say we used uh, relu and then we have uh, another hidden uh, another layer here but this time because we're going to predict the outputs directly we're going to map this into 10 labels so this will be just 10 and we will have to put softmax at the end so that this becomes still 10 nodes, but this becomes probabilistic, right? And then for each example's answer, we're gonna take that probability as our uh, objective to maximize. Or if you take the log and take the negative, then we'll, we'll try to minimize it. Right, so that's why it's NLL, negative like log like ne negative log likelihood, and that will be basically our MLE, right? A symbol. So equation wise, what then? Let's say this is Y. Actually, I'll not say it's Y. Um, I'll say it's it's probability distribution, not actual labels. So I'll say it's P. Then what is P? P is equal to you first take w to x and then put some bias and then we put relu i'll just say r and then we put another w into this matrix multiplication plus bias two and then we take softmax of this i'm running out of space so p
right? So this will be our neural network for image classification. That's great, but then how about text classification? There is a one single problem because we can still try to classify movie review into positive, negative. We don't have any problem with the output because this we can do the same thing with the how we did image classification, make this into a probabilistic model. But then there is one issue because the input is not a real vector. Text is not real vector, right? So what is our solution? Just like how we treated gender, we want to categorize text and map each category to one hot vector. But there is another problem because can you categorize text into a finite number of classes? And the answer is no, because there are literally infinite number of possible text. So what is our solution? Then we have to actually tokenize each text into categorizable units. And that's called words, tokens, etc. Because we have finite number of words. We might have finite number of possible text, but we have finite number of words. So that's why we want to tokenize so that we can translate this into one hot vector. And one hot vector, we have fixed size of dimensions we know in, from the beginning. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, okay, so we're a bit over 5.15, sorry for that, because we are a bit late in the beginning due to the um, internet connection issue. But I'll do a quick poll just like last time. So um, whether you had um, any problem understanding. I was lectured today. So the is a uh, understood it all. Um, I had some troubles and uh, I'm very, I think I'm behind. Okay, so could you please uh, participate in this? Oh no. Okay, this poll right now, and then just for one minute. Okay, thank you for your poll. That will be very helpful for me to, I'll just share it, very helpful for me to actually um, paste the class. So it looks like some people had some issues, but still I don't think there, there's anyone who's really behind. So that's really great. Okay, so that's great. So thanks for thanks everyone. We'll see you on Wednesday and I'll actually release, try to release the assignment before the lecture so that we can discuss the assignment during the lecture as well. Thanks a lot.